Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. Do you ever read those articles on stupid criminals, right? They're kind of, sometimes they're clickbait on, on YouTube or on, sometimes they're on your local news. You, you know who they are. You know, the criminal that goes in to rob the bank, has a ski mask covering his entire face, his entire face but has forgotten to remove the uh, badge, his work badge around his neck that has his photo and his uh, uh, name on it, caught by security camera. People like that. You know, the criminals that, um, uh, you know, break into a, 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 a convenience store, come in, steal all the goods, are running out, and instead of running through the window they broke, run into the other window that they didn't break, fall flat on it. Yeah. So um, in this time when we have a wannabe authoritarian president, someone who has no respect for the law, someone who really hates the First Amendment, is trying to turn Americans against the press, someone who's a really good demagogue in convincing, I don't know, a quarter to a third of the American people that whatever he says is right, even if he changes his mind and flip-flops on it 23 times. Thank God, at least, he's a stupid criminal. Just today, Donald Trump has tweeted out that um, his son broke federal law. <laughs> That's what he did. He tweeted out today saying, uh, Don Jr., was just going to get dirt from the Russians on Hillary. Hmm. You see, intent is part of the crime. So the crime, by the way, it's not really a crime called collusion. The crime is 18 U.S.C. 371. Look it up if you want. It's a crime to take anything of value from a foreign government in order to help in a U.S. political campaign. You just can't do it it's a violation of criminal statute. But sometimes it's hard to prove because crimes require intent. If you accidentally took some money that you didn't realize was from a foreign entity, you might have to return it, you might have a campaign violation, you might have to pay fines, but you really need intent to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that someone has committed a crime and to put someone in jail. Well, Donald Trump just admitted the intent. Now to be fair, even without his admission, the evidence for this crime is really large, mostly because he's covering it up, right? Recently, he says, well, yeah, so Don Jr. was trying to break the law by, um, well, that's not the words he used. He said he was trying to get dirt on an opponent from a foreign government, but this isn't against the law. Donald's saying it ain't so, it is against the law. And uh, Donald said, I didn't know anything about it. Yeah, you know, when you're doing something innocent, usually you say, all right, yeah, I did this. What's the deal? You don't try to disrupt the prosecution. You, when you're innocent, you say, all right, investigators, here's what I did. What's the problem? Show me the law, Jay Sekulow says. Show me the law that says this is illegal. Okay, 18 U.S.C. Section 371. Next question. Remember that cover-ups are usually what gets criminals caught. Let's all remember, and I've repeated this before, but I'm gonna repeat it one more time. It's worthy of remembering that there is no evidence to this day, no hard, fast smoking gun evidence that Richard Nixon knew that a bunch of his goons were breaking in to the Watergate office headquarters of the Democratic National Committee and stealing information on his opponent and using it for his campaign. The, People think he knew, and there, there's some suggestion he did know, but we don't have smoking gun evidence of that. That's not what got the House Judiciary Committee to approve articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon. Nope, it was the cover-up. It was the hush money, or more specifically, it was the tape of Richard Nixon saying, we can pay someone to shut up. We can get that money. We can get that. That doomed him. Those are the tapes he didn't want to turn over. Those are the tapes that the United States Supreme Court ruled nine to zero. He did have to turn over. He followed the court order, kind of hard when it's nine to zero against you. And well, the rest is history. But it was the cover-up of the crime that got Richard Nixon in trouble. The crime itself, they could never quite pin on him, even to this day. Even to this day, scholars disagree 
on whether Richard Nixon knew about the Watergate break-in before it happened. So now look at this. Let's take a look at this one. The Watergate burglary, unlike the Trump Tower meeting, did not occur in a different location from where the presidential candidate lived. The Trump Tower is where Donald Trump lives and works. Not only that, but the main people at the meeting were not some low-level Watergate burglars that no one had ever heard of. They were the president's son, the president's, the president's son-in-law, and the president's campaign manager. You may have heard of him, Paul Manafort, currently on trial in my home city of Alexandria, Virginia, um, about to have his business partner, Rick Gates, testify tomorrow. Uh, I don't think they let you wear ostrich suits in prison, Paul. These three not only met with the Russians when the Russians said, we're going to give you dirt on this. Not only that, but they met two days before the Russia meeting. Two days before Don Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort met in Trump Tower to discuss strategy for a meeting they would later call unimportant, to discuss strategy of how to handle the Russians. He didn't have a lawyer in the room, something that Steve Bannon called so stupid as to be traitorous. Yes, Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon, he, he may be, not he may be, he is a racist, but he's not stupid. No one ever accused Steve Bannon of being stupid. Uh, they met beforehand two days before, and you know what also happened two days before that Russian meeting? On the same day that Paul Manafort and Don Jr. and Jared Kushner got together to discuss the dirt they were going to get on Hillary Clinton, the thing of value they were going to get from a foreign adversary, from an enemy of the United States. You know what also happened that day? Donald Trump announced that same day that he was going to have some really good dirt on Hillary Clinton. He was going to expose the Clintons. Just you wait for it. Coming up soon. They didn't get the dirt they wanted when they met with the Russians. And lo and behold, Donald Trump didn't give that speech that he promised two days earlier, right after his son and Jared Kushner and Paul Manafort met to discuss their, their later meeting with the Russians. Remember, Donald Trump likes to be told everything. He gets very angry when people act behind his back. And no one could be more of a... Um, toady, a follower, uh, uh, than his son or his son-in-law, Jerry Kushner, or his campaign manager, Paul Manafort. So they ask us to say that Donald Trump didn't know about it. But the best way to tell when someone's in trouble is the lies they do to spin themselves out of trouble. Let me give you an example. If you came home and your 10-year-old uh, was with the babysitter and you come home and the kid's sleeping and happy and then the babysitter tells you he did something bad, you, you might question the babysitter. But if you run home, 10 p.m., you come home, and before the babysitter can say a word, your son says, don't believe the babysitter. It's all a witch hunt, it's all fake news. Don't believe a word she has to say. And I didn't know anything about it. Um, you might suspect your kid did something bad. Methinks he doth protest too much, to uh, paraphrase Shakespeare. Remember what they said about the meeting. First, Donald Trump Jr. said that there was no meeting whatsoever. He'd had no meetings at all with the Russians. Then he said, okay, he had some meetings with the Russians, but nothing of any substance, nothing that really mattered. Nothing that they'd set up, he said to the New York Times. Okay, then they found out he set up a meeting. But they said that he set up the meeting and um, they didn't talk about anything important. All they talked about were adoptions. It was a statement that was read to the press. And by the way, his lawyers made it very clear that Donald Trump didn't know about the meeting, didn't know about the statement. That was just Don Jr. Donald Trump played no role in drafting the statement. And then we learn that Donald Trump personally dictated the statement that both Sarah Huckabee Sanders and his lawyer Jay Sekulow denied that he had any role in. He personally dictated it word for word. And then we learned that it had nothing to do with adoption. 
and everything to do with sanctions against the Russians, which was the kind of thing that, oh, I don't know, is the quid of a quid pro quo. And then we learn that the sanctions for the Russians were in exchange for dirt from Hillary Clinton, about Hillary Clinton, that they'd gotten via illegal espionage. And then we learn, I mean, the stories keep changing. Then we learn that when Donald Trump heard he was going to get dirt on Hillary Clinton, he responded with the two words saying he wasn't sure about this. Those two words were, love it. And then we learn that they had the pre-meeting. And then now it appears that Donald Trump's lawyer and fixer, Michael Cohen, is about to testify that Donald Trump knew all about the meeting, which really should surprise no one. And now Donald Trump admits that the meeting was about collecting dirt on Hillary Clinton. I mean, it's an incredible spin of lies. Also remember that Donald Trump specifically asked the Russians to hack in, to commit espionage, and to you know, break U.S. law, <laughs> to get into DNC servers. He said he wasn't like Richard Nixon. We don't know whether Richard Nixon ordered the Watergate break-in or not. But we do know that Donald Trump ordered the Russians to break in and steal the material to do via cyber exactly what the Watergate burglars did, except that he asked them to in public. I remember when that happened, come on this radio show saying, did Donald Trump just ask for treason? And we also know that the day he asked the Russians, are you listening to do that? The Russians did exactly that. We also know that in the break-in, the Russians got not just data, emails, private emails, what they also got was analytics. What are analytics? Well, as someone who's running a couple of campaigns, analytics are critical data in a, in a campaign. Uh, analytics are crucial. You got to know these voters are supporting you and these voters aren't. And here's what our internal polls show. And these are the issues that, that work and these are the issues that don't work. And in a national campaign, it's critical to know that you have a chance in Michigan, you have a chance in Wisconsin, you have no chance in Arizona. And all of Hillary Clinton's data was transferred over to the Russians on her campaign by her campaign manager, John Podesta. And we know that starting in September, which is exactly when the Russians got it, starting in September, the Republicans changed their strategy, started focusing on that Midwestern blue wall they hadn't focused on before, just after the Russians got the data. It doesn't take a genius to put these dots together. The evidence is overwhelming, and my friends, it's much bigger than impeachment now. These are crimes that could put Donald J. Trump in jail for the rest of his life. And I say the sooner the better. That's right. This is a show where we're adding a letter to the impeachment. We are not at I-M-P-E. I'll let you know when we get to A. Major, major development today, and one that I think will, well, be the future of this presidency. Call it if you want, 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. Right back, right after this. He's a Bible-quoting, Constitution-loving, flag-waving, red-blooded, liberal America. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Hello, Facebook audience. Hope you're doing well. Just getting everything set up. If you want to call in, you know how. To all my new Instagram listeners, hello. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. Glad to have you here. You can listen live on... Uh, Facebook or um, actually on my website at marklevingtalk.com. Also tune in. Also tune in. That's right. We've got a new podcast. I need to say that on the air. It's actually not a new podcast. We've had it for some time, but I haven't broadcast it very much. 
um, let people know about it. And Mark, I didn't hear your comment. I heard something, and then I uh, maybe it wasn't loud enough. Oh, maybe it, yeah, maybe I was just I was jumping in because I was just saying I I I want to see the day that a mom or dad comes home and before the babysitter can talk, the child says, "Fake news." Yeah, fake news. Fake don't news. don't believe the babysitter. Don't believe her. Fake news. <laughs> yeah, I mean to me that's a sign of guilt, right? When your yes. kid says that. Oh my gosh, of course. I was just dying though, because I'm like, <laughs> I, I'd be like, listen, you get a lot of credit. You're still grounded, but. Yeah. I'm reading Julian Joshua's comment. Yep, you're absolutely right, Julian. Absolutely right. Listen, I think the people who are waiting like the Democrats that are waiting are simply saying the truth, which is we need to see everything Mueller has. I think we have enough in public to convict him already. And I know that Mueller's data is, is I don't know, I presume based on the weight of evidence and my respect for the great prosecutor that's Robert Mueller, that he has three times, four times, five times the evidence we've seen in public. So um, I think people are just waiting. Um, I think there's a decent shot that Mueller will get his information out prior to the November elections. Um, listen, November elections, impeachment's on the table. Whatever Nancy Pelosi says, impeachment is on the table. Uh, and if this information comes out in time, hopefully it will persuade some Americans to, to get out and vote. Because I know they say that every election is the most important in our lifetimes, but when you have a chance to go to an authoritarian government or not and this is yeah it's critical so what were you going to say about the uh, babysitting mark just to, you just thought the no i just was jumping in and just saying i couldn't wait for it you know i'd love to see a kid a kid try to get away with that. no collusion fake yeah, no news. collusion fake news mom i don't believe the babysitter and whatever it is don't believe your little my little brother it's a exactly. lie. It's a complete lie. Exactly. I don't know what you're talking about, J Donald. It's a lie. And he sounds just even more ridiculous. Well, you yeah, because most kids are better yeah. liars. I mean, again, we have to be thankful for this. If we're going to have an orange Mussolini, at least we have a stupid orange Mussolini. <sighs> Got to count your blessings where you can. And now the voice Ready, Mark? Of Ready. Here we go. Reasonable world. Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Want to plug a couple shows we've got this week. Um, tomorrow, I'm going to have um, Senator Amanda Chase. She's a Virginia State Senator. I'm a Virginia State Delegate. And she and I work together on bringing transparency to the Virginia government. It may be the only thing we agree on. Amanda and I disagree on virtually everything else, but we're, we're friends. We get along. And I'm going to ask her the really, what I consider to be a very tough question of how, what's it like to be a Republican and to have this president? I don't really know how she can address that. And then I've also got another Republican coming on Thursday because part of what I try to do is try to understand the other side and uh, that's Mike Lane. He's been on my show before. He's, a again, a local uh, Republican um, who's um, held elective office in the past. Um, and Mike is what you might call a mainstream Republican, a conservative Republican. He's like a Marco Rubio Republican. I know Mike believes in free trade. I know Mike doesn't like Vladimir Putin. How, what do you do when your own president violates principles that you have? What's it going to take? I mean, Donald Trump, as the number of Republicans goes down and down and fewer and fewer Americans are rightly calling themselves Republicans, those that still do are wildly supporting him. So I think on a progressive radio, you need to help understand why. Why? Because Kavanaugh will outlaw abortion? 
Is that what it's all about? Because your billionaire CEO will get a new tax cut and that's what makes it okay to rip children away from their parents, lock them up in cages. Think about that, by the way. The people are like, well, you know, I hate Donald Trump, but I'm pro-life. Do you think that those people who are pro-life give a damn about children? I mean, I know they love the fetuses. God knows those embryos, the egg and the sperm, you know, every sperm is sacred, right? That's what they say on Monty Python. Don't waste a single one of the trillions of sperm around. But do they care about kids? I mean, when an agent is ripping a child, an infant, away from her mother's breast while nursing, and then they want to bring, forcibly bring more poor children in the world to suffer? These are some tough questions. And one of the things I hope you'll join in for, again, special Tuesday show. We don't normally do a show on Tuesday. Special show tomorrow featuring Senator Amanda Chase. And we'll have a chance to call in and hear from you. And then I've got Mike Lane on Thursday. Call in. Let me know about um, talking about, do you think Donald Trump has already uh, and Mark, we admitted? One more announcement just in. Um... Uh, from the popular podcast, Pod Save America, we have one of the hosts, Dan Pfeiffer, who used to work in the Obama administration uh, next. Um, two weeks. That's in two weeks. Or two weeks. Yeah. yeah so I was kind of letting that go because because he's uh, uh, around the corner. I mean, not around the corner, but we'll get to him as well. Hey, also, check out my podcast. Sometimes you can't watch me live. Just go to iTunes. Look up podcast. Look up Mark Levine, M-A-R-K-L-E-V-I-N-E, and download the podcast. We'll be right back right after this. My name is Mira Batra. I have been in this country 32 years. and this Sorry, that's the 20th, is it? Life. Yeah, 20th, America that's right. Yeah, so I was happy we got him. No, I'm happy we had him too, but I, um, it's in two weeks, so I thought that was too far away. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> it's okay. I actually texted your email to you back to let you know it was in two weeks. Wait, what did you send? Uh, nothing. So Sorry I, about it. I just I texted okay, your email to you to tell you that it was oh, gotcha, two weeks, gotcha. not one week. You'd said next Monday, and I saw the 20th. Gotcha, thanks. So is he there for a full hour? He's going to do the first half hour. First half hour. Is he? Um, he's in San Francisco, so he's going to okay. do it by phone. By phone. Okay. Community, and when we do, we unite them. We make the community stronger. What I do is something I wish someone had done for me, and I'm so grateful I'm able to. My name is Mira Batra. I help families. Okay, let's turn off the feed. Succeed. And you have your comments from Julian there? Uh, yeah, I read it. Got I it. I kind of responded to him in, in the uh, – but, I mean, he's absolutely right, of course. Mark Forbes asks, where's Mark? What? Uh, hi, Mark Forbes, whoever you are. <laughs> kind of a strange question. Oh, where are you, maybe? You, I don't know what he's asking. All right. Oh, maybe. I didn't even realize that. There I, was I don't know. There was only one Mark. I'm just, I like that. Good. We just call me other Mark. No, no, no. It's all good. The backup. We're all good. Underling, peon Mark. Careful. A peon? No, I just, um, given what Donald Trump has been accused of. Oh, oh I'm talking about I know what you're talking like about. Oh, just no. Be, be oh, aware. Be yep. aware. That was pretty good. Words could be misused. You're just very, you're very clean, so I never even thought your <laughs> mind would go there, you know? Sorry, it didn't used to, and then we elected no, this I know, guy. <laughs> I know, just by following the news, you know? Jeez, no kidding. <laughs> a friend of mine just posted a New Yorker cartoon it says every time I feel like saying something I shouldn't I ask myself what would the president do and then I go ahead and say it yeah <laughs> that's so perfect yep. for the moment it's true the world in which we live Be back in another minute, Facebook friends.
back shortly. Back to the aggressive progress. Ready, Mark? Ready. Here you go. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. We talked about the fact that, well, Donald Trump is digging his own criminal grave. Uh, but what of his base? I mean, why is he in power to begin with? And why do people still continue to support him? It's one thing to have been tricked by him. I could argue you should never have been tricked by him, given his past before he ran for president. But OK, who still believes his lies? We find, interestingly, that his lies are growing in number. Prior to June 1st of this year, Donald Trump gave, on average, six lies a day. Now, to be fair, that's far more than any other president in history. I mean, you can generally remember one or two or three lies by a president, maybe about Vietnam or something like that. Maybe the president lied once a month, maybe once a week. This president was lying six times a day. But Donald Trump can beat his own records. And in June and July, according to the Washington Post, which has spelled out each and every one of the thousands of lies he's done, he's now up to 16 lies a day. What? 16 lies a day. That's hard to do. I mean, how do you, I mean, you have to work hard to do 16 lies a day. Do the math. It's about 480 lies a month, 960 lies in two months. And yes, there's 978 lies in two months. So it's a little bit more than 16 lies a day. And the question is, who are these people that are supporting him? One of the reasons why I want to have a lot of Republicans on air, and I'm having uh, Amanda Smith tomorrow and, and Mike Lane on Thursday, is to try to get in the mind of Republicans. And Steve Schmidt has done so, I think, very well. Steve Schmidt was the GOP strategist for John McCain right? Standard Republican helping John McCain beat Barack Obama didn't succeed, but certainly a very classic Republican, not someone on the fringes. Here's what Steve Schmidt said. I'm going to quote him verbatim. He said, quote, what we're seeing is five things. We're seeing somebody go to mass rallies, constantly lie to incite fervor in a cult of personality base. We're seeing him make victimization honorable. They're all victims, right? We're seeing the allegation of conspiracy, the deep state, hidden nefarious movements that only the leader, capital L, can see. We're seeing the scapegoating of minority populations, the vulnerable populations. And lastly, the assertion that, quote, I need to exercise these powers that no president has ever claimed to have, unquote. This is deliberate. This is an assault on objective truth. And once you get people to surrender their sovereignty, when they think, quote, what is true is what the leader says is true, or, quote, what is true is what the leader believes is true, unquote, even though what is actually true is staring you in the face, when that happens, you're no longer living in a democratic republic. Again, I'm quoting Steve Schmidt. GOP strategist, high up in the John McCain campaign, standard die-in-the-wool Republican, but honestly looking at what's going on all around him. To continue the quote from Steve Schmidt, quote, 35% of this country has checked out. They have joined a cult. They are obedient to the leader, all caps. And this is straight out of 1984. When Winston, at the end of the book, when the party leader is holding up four fingers and says, Winston, how many fingers are there? And Winston says, I see four. And the leader of the party says, but it could be three and it could be five. It's whatever the party tells you. And that is when democracy dies in America. Unquote. I need to go back and reread 1984. It's one of those books, though, and I haven't read it probably, probably since eighth grade. So I haven't read it in decades but it's the kind of book that stays with you. I remember 1984. I remember being transported to that dark dystopian world of Big Brother, where Big Brother comes on the screen and incites hatred 
against others, incites hatred against other people. 1984 obviously was written by George Orwell in 1948. He merely switched the two last digits around. It occurred just after World War II, after the Holocaust. It was a commentary on fascism when Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, but more Hitler, was encouraging people to hate the Jews or gays or gypsies or the disabled or really anyone else that was in his way, even Catholic priests when they were in his way. In, the, um, in 1984, they bring the, the figure of Goldman on their screen. They never quite explain who he is, but he's the enemy. He's the evil person. And everyone shouts out at the theater, hate, hate at this man. Almost like you can hear them chant, CNN sucks or fake news. Now, all around Jim Acosta of CNN, people are shouting at him, screaming at him throwing things at him, um, and he's reporting it very bravely. He has not suffered any violence so far. Stay safe, Jim Acosta. But this is the beginning. I've talked at length of the fact that the way to cook a frog, if you want to cook a frog live, is not to throw a live frog in a pot of boiling water. He will jump out. But you put the frog in cold water, and you slowly heat it up, and by the time the frog is boiling, well, he's cooked. That's how you destroy a democracy. And kudos to Steve Schmidt for talking about it, for talking about the cult. And when I talk with Trumpists, it sounds exactly like when I talk with Scientologists or when I hear from the people who drank the Kool-Aid for Reverend Jim Jones. It is a cult. In a cult, the leader says, don't believe what's in front of your own eyes. Don't believe it. Believe something else. Believe what I tell you to believe. Don't think for yourself. Allow me to think for you. We've talked about the fact that Adolf Eichmann, uh, one of the main architects of the Holocaust, loved to join things, loved to follow orders, loved to follow strong leaders. You, you may not understand it because you don't have that authoritarian sensibility. Maybe, probably, you're a Democrat. Progressives don't tend to believe it. Progressives tend to want to fight the power. Progressives tend to want to, to challenge everything and find out what's going on, and that's always been my, my mentality. But some people feel comfort in just following orders and just doing what the dear leader, the Fuhrer, tells them to say, tells them to think. And that was true of a lot of the Germans that were just following order. And don't think it can't happen here. Don't ever think it can't happen here. Nothing about America is any different from the Germans or the Japanese or the Ukrainians or the Poles or anyone else who participated in the Holocaust. Or it's not just white people, the Hutus and the Tutsis. What did the Hutus and Tutsis say about each other before the, the genocide that occurred in Rwanda? They, one of them said that the other one was vermin. They were infesting. When you start treating people like animals, it's easier to kill them, even easier when you treat them like insects. But just the Nazis that did it. And it's not just Africa. It's in Asia. You find it in, in Cambodia, in the bloody fields. You find it today in the Middle East, in Syria. In Syria, where the leader of the country, Bashar al-Assad, has massacred more than half a million people and is massacring hundreds of thousands as we speak. And nobody talks about it. Don't think it can't happen in America. In America, the land where we took over from Native Americans and basically murdered 90 plus percent of them. In America, where we had slavery for 300 years and then even, even after slavery, well, okay, slavery for 250 years. And then even after slavery was abolished, continued to deny full-class citizenship to African-Americans for another 100 years, and there's still racism today. In America, where we actually did burn witches, sorry, Donald Trump, you're not in the danger that the women of Salem were in. In America, where we took Japanese Americans and locked them up, innocent civilians in internment camps. In America, where we pull children away from their parents forevermore children of immigrants, parents seeking asylum, just as virtually all our great-grandparents did. 
don't think that because America is your country that we're above all this cruelty. I have to still think America is the greatest country on earth, but we're the greatest country on earth when we live up to our ideals. We're the greatest country on earth when we welcome immigrants. And by the way, all you so-called Christians, so-called Christians who are okay with blocking our doors to refugees, I'm sorry, you're not Christian at all. The Bible speaks eloquently about the need to take in the stranger and to help the stranger. You're not Christian. What would Jesus do? Would Jesus separate children from their parents? Don't, don't give me this self-righteousness. What are we to do with sheeple? What are we to do with people who act like sheep? What do you do with people who are easily riled up and persuaded to commit acts of violence? Well, we have to defeat them the same way Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi did. We have to defeat violence with nonviolence. We have to stand up as the civil rights marchers did, vastly outnumbered, and in the face of evil, stand firm and proud and unbending. We are America. We are the majority. And the moment we give up, the moment we let this minority of sheeple, this minority of dictatorship-loving, authoritarian-minded thugs who are our fellow Americans, the moment we give in to them and let them take over and say, well, you know, I guess it isn't as bad as I thought, is the moment we sacrifice our own country. So, yeah, we got to fight. We're in the fight of our lives. Call in at 888 mark 888 We'll be right back right after this. Never confuse Mark Levine with right-winger Mark Levin. The second E stands for empathy, which the other Mark lacks. Give him a call now at 888 Tristan, I think some... Yes, I think there's a big blue wave in November. Many Republicans will start abandoning Trump. I actually think that if Robert Mueller puts forward his report before November, and I think there's a good chance he might, or if he doesn't put forward his full report, um, at least issue enough indictments or enough information as to give the American people a good idea uh, of what's going on. I mean, um, the one part where I agree with, with, um, <laughs> with Giuliani is that he needs to wrap it up in the sense of he needs to get that information before the American people, before we decide. Because after all, whether or not Donald Trump is impeached or removed from office, it's largely going to be based on the elections. Not just the fact that we need a Republican House to even impeach him, but we need two-thirds to convict him in the Senate. And that's not going to happen unless an overwhelmingly large number of Americans reject the corruption and the treason that is, is everywhere in the Trump administration. And so we need more information. So I don't want to press Robert Mueller to go too fast, but the more information he can give us prior to November, the more he can achieve really what his goal is. I mean, the goal of Robert Mueller should not only be to prosecute crimes, although that's part of it. The goal should also be to give the American people the information we need in order to provide a check and balance to our corrupt government. But to answer your question, Tristan, yes, I do think a big blue wave in November or even a threat of a big blue wave can persuade Republicans in the middle to abandon Trump. Of course, most of those Democrats should beat anyway. Going to get to Michael when we get back. If you want to call in as well, it's 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. And um, we'll be back shortly. Again, special shows tomorrow and Thursday.
Mark, should I tell both callers to hold that we're going to yeah, get to them? Yeah, I'm going to get to them. Get it. I only in see which order. Did I only you see one. Go in? I only see one call. Yeah, Julian and Michael. Okay. Oh, Julian's calling. Oh, yeah. I didn't really say Julian was calling. Okay, I'll do Julian first. Now, Got it. Here you go. In an unreasonable world. Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Got about eight minutes left. Time for a couple calls. Let's go to Julian uh, from Alexandria, but now living in California, line three. Hey, Julian, how are you? Hi, Mark. Great. Um, I, just before I ask my question, I hope you'll do uh, a show soon about the devastating effects of climate change and how we should take it seriously. We, but to go on Actually, that's a fair point, particularly given your fires in California. Um, exactly. we, we don't get enough focus here on the East Coast. So that's a very good yeah. point. Yeah, good point. Now, I will. What, I wanted to, what I wanted to comment was the following. You still see pundits going on television, um, supposedly seriously, saying things like, um, oh, there's not enough evidence against Trump. Um, the evidence is purely circumstantial. Or there's some of them even say there's no evidence. Uh, but um, conspiracy cases are, are there really are eyewitnesses. Most of the evidence in conspiracy cases is circumstantial evidence or a mix of circumstantial and direct evidence. The other thing I wanted to say was every day in America, prosecutors obtain thousands of convictions based on less evidence than right. there is out right. there. Right, right. That's exactly what I was going to say. Already. That's right. I mean, I mean, the evidence here is much greater than your ordinary yeah. conspiracy case. Far, far, far more. When you ask the, you know, pundits say there's not enough evidence, I would say which pundits? If they're Fox yeah. News pundits, if they're conservatives, we all know what acts they have to grind, uh, you know, whose, whose side they're on. If it's Democrats, I think you'll find that the smarter Democrats, uh, the elected officials, say, well, I want to see Mueller's report first. Well, do you think there's enough evidence? If, if I were asked that question, I would say, yes, I do think there's enough evidence, but I think it would be wrong to take action until we see Mueller's report. Yeah. Uh, we, should, yeah. we should have the fullest accounting possible. And I think that, oh, yeah. I think that part is fair. But to say there's not enough evidence, these people are not lawyers or haven't done trials or, or, or clearly have an axe to grind. Because you're absolutely right, Julian. The evidence is much larger than in ordinary conspiracy cases. Yeah, and anyway, prosecution 101 is follow the money, join the dots, tell the jury to use their common sense. Works every time. You know, it's really easy in this case. Frankly, when this whole collusion thing started, I did not think they would find at the end of the day, as much as they've already found right now. I didn't know about the meeting with uh, uh, Natalie Veselnyskaya. I didn't know, uh, you know, all I knew, I knew Manafort had been connected to Ukraine. I knew Donald Trump. We haven't even gotten to this point of the story yet. I knew Donald Trump had taken loans out from Russian banks and had used, basically helped money launder uh, some Russian loans. We really haven't gotten to that, that part of the story yet. I think that's coming. But, I mean, the meeting, even Steve Bannon said this was traitorous. When Steve Bannon, you know, right-wing jerk that he is, and jerk is the nicest word I can use on radio. I can think of a few others that I had to just quickly edit out of my mind. Uh, when even Steve Bannon, this racist white supremacist, um, but not dumb, admits that the president's son and son-in-law and, and, and campaign manager are engaged in traitorous acts, that's Steve Bannon's quote, not mine, uh, you know that this president's in serious trouble. And I just think the drip, drip, drip is going to get worse and worse and worse, particularly since Donald Trump is so angered that he's apparently screaming in the White House and running around and even lying at a much greater rate. I mean, from 6 to 16, that's two and a half times the lying he did before. That's a lot of lies. 16 lies, that's like, you know, a lie an hour every, every yeah. moment you're awake, on average. That oh, and, and Mark, by the way, although it may not be a crime to lie to the American people in public, every single lie that is put out there by Trump and all his uh, followers, that is all direct evidence of consciousness of guilt. That's right. And, and obstruction of justice. Yeah. That's right. Consciousness of guilt and obstruction of justice. Very good points, Julian. Thanks for calling in. I appreciate it. Let's go to Michael Old Faithful on line four. Hey, Michael, how are you? Hey, Mark. Well, I'm not in the Bronx today. I'm up in Massachusetts on vacation. Good for you. Glad you're still I, I listening. Had to call. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And you know something, I don't know if you recall me telling you this, but I knew for a moment, remember I kept saying, all we got to do is go to the audio, go to the video, and now even go to the tweets, and you see the multiple contradictions on this guy, and pretty much the leaking, the um, the crimes that's being brought forth, and with I think this is just the beginning of it, and lo and behold, what's so interesting that you mentioned about Trump ripping the children away from the parents, mm -hmm. and to this very day, they still have not complied no. and fulfilled That's that true. court order to reunite those children. Nope, there's more than 700 children that remain yes. ununited. That's so, correct. So when you look at it, right, he's, he's busy attacking the press, calling him any of the people with his inciting violence. He's attacking more minorities. And it, and when it comes to reuniting the children, now he's saying, well, the ACLU he, um, should be um, reuniting the children. You have to find the court order even further. You know, what's, what's interesting is that, is that with the children, I actually think he, his, or his, he's not just sadistic, but he's incompetently, incompetently sadistic. Again, to compare with the Nazis. The Nazis were sadistic, but competently so. They they kept lists of all their cruelty and tried to do so, kill as many, you know, with the least cost and least problem. Uh, Donald Trump is, he's got the sadistic gene, but he doesn't, he's not competent. So I honestly believe that they don't know where some of these, they know where others are, and but they don't know where all of them are. And so he's like, oh, I don't know, uh, so you, you figure it out. Well, I think the answer is if Donald Trump wants to give the ACLU $10 million from his budget uh, in order to find out where the kids were, you know, that's, that's an agreement that could be reached. But you're absolutely right. He, it's, 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 it's frightening that kids would be separated from their parents for a lifetime, all because of the cruelty of, of Donald Trump and the Republican Party. Thanks for your call, Michael. We only got a couple of minutes left. I want you, as you watch the news, to watch carefully. and make it a practice to discern truth from fiction. Watch Fox News, but watch CNN, watch MSNBC, read the Washington Post and New York Times. Honestly, the best reporting that I've seen comes out of those two newspapers, the Washington Post and New York Times. If you don't have a subscription, this is not an ad. They're not paying me to say this, but um, that's where your money is well spent. At a time when the President of the United States is purposely kicking members of the press out, removing them for asking tough questions. At a time when the President of the United States is working people up into an angry fury over the press and putting them in pens and then encouraging people to attack them. It's interesting. I was reading one report of the attacks on Jim Acosta. They, when the cameras were on, the people were yelling at him and screaming at him. And when the cameras were off, well, they wanted pictures of him and selfies with him. This is theater, but it's theater that's fully persuading 35% of Americans who are stupid and, and, I mean, just too ignorant enough to understand what's going on. It's up to you to police the truth. It's up to you to tell your neighbors. It's up to you to call them out. This is Mark Levine. See you tomorrow. Signing off. Hello, I'm Ken Great Ken work, Ross. Mark. Thank Sam you. Mason.